Associate Professor Raswana Begum. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I Sir, I support the amendments proposed by this bill. The bill will make timely and necessary improvements to the Child Development Co-Savings Act as we continue to design and implement a Singapore made for families. Since 1987, when Singapore ended its stop at two population policy, a range of pro-natalist initiatives have been introduced. These include paid maternity and paternity leave, childcare subsidies, tax relief, rebates, cash gifts and grants. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to note that Singapore currently boasts one of the most comprehensive set of programs and policies in East Asia to promote marriage, increase fertility and birth rates, and provide incentives and support to couples wishing to start or grow a family. Despite these considerable efforts, Singapore is still struggling to encourage couples to marry and when married, to have children. In 2022, Singapore's total fertility rate was 1.05, the lowest it has ever been. This decline can be attributed to two key factors. First, more people are staying single or getting married later in life. And second, married couples are waiting longer to have their first child and having fewer children overall. Both of these factors are influenced by evolving cultural, social and economic circumstances. Women are increasingly questioning the expectation to marry early, have children, and stay at home to look after their children. Women are increasingly able to access independent and financially rewarding careers, both within and outside the marriage. And women are increasingly aware of the significant cost of raising children. Mr. Speaker, our government acknowledges these challenges and has taken steps to facilitate marriage housing access, education, and financial stability. These initiatives are particularly vital for women who historically bear child-rearing responsibilities. Gender equality is crucial for Singapore's continued success, as emphasized in the 2022 White Paper on Singapore Women's Development. To achieve this, we must maintain women's rights, make family life enriching, and continuously engage Singaporean girls' and women's perspective. On that note, I would like to highlight a study, The Aspiration of Singapore Muslim Women, carried out by the non-profit organization, Singapore Muslim Women's Association, PPIS, in 2021. The study revealed that Muslim women's top family aspirations include work-life balance, financial stability, and ability to raise children well. Mr. Speaker, at this juncture, it's pertinent to mention that I currently serve on the board of PPIS. It is heartening to note that over the years, our government has implemented policies to encourage married persons in Singapore to have more children. As mentioned, I welcome the changes in the bill as it aims to provide additional support to make child rearing an appealing and affordable option for couples. However, I seek some clarifications about some of the proposed amendments. Before I do so, I would like to share my personal experience as a mother who benefited from the Child Development Co-Savings Act. In 2001, I was working full-time as a probation officer with the Ministry of Community Development and Sports. In May of that year, my second child was born, and he qualified for the baby bonus scheme. This greatly eased the financial strain of raising two young children. I remember bringing my son home. My firstborn, who was two and a half years at that time, was eagerly waiting for his tambi brother in Tamil, and couldn't understand why his baby brother spent most of his time sleeping. In his excitement to play with his brother, he threw a toy police car into his crib. Luckily, he missed. Interestingly, both my boys later completed their national service with the Singapore Police Force, and I believe the toy police car may have played a part in that. As a working mother, it was difficult to supervise and care for two children under the age of three, and keeping them both safe was my utmost priority. My eldest child attended childcare, a direct benefit of the baby bonus scheme, and my mother took care of the baby. I was also very fortunate to have supervisors who believe in measuring performance by outcomes and who allowed me to work from home. 
This was an immense relief, and I wouldn't have been able to balance my responsibilities as a mother and a probation officer without the support of my supervisors. I consider myself privileged to have received emotional support from my mother, financial support from the government by way of the baby bonus, and practical support from my employer. These opportunities allowed me to work from home, excel in my career, and continue my education. Importantly, these opportunities allowed me to be a mother to my two wonderful children. Mr. Speaker, I welcome the amendments to Section 7. These amendments will assist to ensure the quality and professionalism of health and educational services provided by approved persons to children and their families. With regards to approved persons, what are the eligibility criteria for approved persons and what support or training provided to help them meet this criteria? In the last three years, how many approved persons had their approval suspended and revoked and why? What support is given to approved persons when suspended to help them regain their approval? If an approved person can no longer serve a child or a family due to suspension or revocation, what are the obligations in arranging alternative care, especially if they provide childcare services? Will the proposed duties for officers and employees of approved persons include an understanding of policies and procedures necessary to safeguard children who access their services? Mr. Speaker, I also welcome the proposed amendment to Section 12H. The amendment will provide greater financial support to self-employed men. I would, however, welcome additional information on the support that exists for gig workers facing income loss due to parenting responsibilities and whether the amendment cover gig workers, including those with casual or temporary hours and who have irregular income. Finally, I welcome the proposed amendments to Section 12HA and Section 12JA. These amendments, I believe, will, strength, will send a strong signal about the government's commitment to a family-friendly Singapore. However, I note that strong gender imbalances with respect to parenting, family and household responsibilities still exist across many East Asian countries, including Singapore. On that note, do we have current data on fathers' use of parental leave, particularly in the private sector, given that MSF reported that 84% of public sector employees eligible for paternity leave accessed this leave? What initiatives are in place to encourage men to utilize their paternity leave entitlements, and how do we plan to address factors like company culture and social norms that may prevent parent, fathers from taking up the leave. How are we promoting more equal parenting roles in households, especially during paternity leave, considering gender imbalances? What measures are in place to encourage employers to support family-friendly environment for a healthy, respectful work-life balance? Mr. Speaker, by addressing the concerns raised, I believe we can collectively advance towards achieving the mandate a Singapore truly made for families. I appreciate members' attention and I would like to conclude by sharing remarks from Deputy Prime Minister Hing Swee during the launch of A Singapore Made for Families 2025 in November 2022. On that occasion, he noted, and I quote, establishing a supportive and adaptable work environment for employees to achieve work-life harmony is not only pro-family, but also pro-business. Workers can balance their work and family responsibilities, are better able to contribute effectively at their workplace. Clarifications notwithstanding, I conclude in support of the bill. Thank you, Associate Professor Raswana, for sharing your story. Indeed, support from all stakeholders uh, is important.